Hello everyone. Once a young man set out for a walk in the forest. Unaccustomed to outdoors and having no GPS or map with him, he started to lose his sense of direction. As the minutes turned into hours, he began to feel hungry. He anxiously searched for food but could not find anything. Just when he was beginning to lose hope, he saw a notice board on a stake in the bushes. Fresh bread, baked daily, follow the arrow. Delighted and rather relieved, the young man set off again, walking in the direction the arrow pointed. Not long after, he saw a lone house sitting on a hillside and a big signboard beside the house with inscription that said fresh bread baked daily and then underneath in red letters we never close feeling hungrier than ever the young man knocked on the door sure enough the door swung open and he was greeted by an elderly woman no sooner had the man said, I saw your signs, than the woman, with a proud smile on her face, said, Yes, are in they good signs? Well, ma'am, can I buy some bread? The young man continued. No, there is no bread, replied the woman. But, but the sign, the man protested. We only make signboards, not bread, said the woman. Feeling incredulous and disheartened, the young man said, I have never heard anything so ridiculous in all my life. A sign promising bread, but then no bread? And that said, he was walking away. Just then the woman said to him, You don't have to go away, young man. My husband and I will be delighted to share a meal with you. Friends, this is only a story. Yet it stands as a reminder that if we live more authentic, meaningful and purposeful Christian lives, our hope in Jesus Christ will not disappoint us, deceive us or delude us in the end. That is to say, Every promised blessing, including the heavenly feast with the Lord Jesus Christ, can be ours if we keep our focus on Jesus and his directives despite all the distractions of life. However, fear is an obstacle to living such a life and it has been present in human beings since the beginning of time. Friends, Knowing that the Israelites were full of fear, God told them numerous times through his chosen servants, the prophets, not to fear in spite of overwhelming challenges or dangers, and instead to put their confidence and trust in him all the time. Moreover, God had promised through the prophet Isaiah to send a miraculous child, Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God is with us. Friends, throughout his public ministry on earth, Jesus spent a great deal of time trying to point out to people that he is truly Emmanuel, the promised one, and that all the miracles and wonders which he was doing in their midst were in fact signs of God's presence. Yet. Lots of people, including the twelve disciples who lived and walked with Jesus, heard his teaching and saw his miracles, but still found it hard to have total faith in him. Friends, the Bible indicates that fear rather than doubt is the reason for lack of faith. The disciples did believe in the existence of God and in Christ. Otherwise, they would not have so easily left him behind all to follow him. But they were often anxious and afraid. They feared storms, ridicule, shame, persecution, suffering and the future. 
and Jesus responded by rebuking them for their fear and lack of faith in him, and at the same time reassuring them of his presence with them always. He told them that they are more precious than sparrows, and even the hairs of their head are all numbered. Therefore, they should not have to worry about their life and their essential needs in life, such as food, drink and clothing. Furthermore, we read last week that Jesus warned his disciples about hoarding. After telling them the parable of the rich fool who was greedily storing up earthly possessions, but unaware of his impending death that very night, Jesus encouraged them to de detach themselves from self-centered desire for material possessions of this transient world and to store up instead treasures in heaven that will last forever. Friends, in today's Gospel, Jesus further illustrates the meaning of faith. He begins his teaching by calling his disciples little flock to show how dear they were to him and to God and then tells them not to be afraid. They have no reason to fear because as their good shepherd he is near them. Moreover, to prove once and for all his abundant love, God the Father wants with great delight to give them the kingdom. Friends, here the kingdom refers not to the earthly kingdom which comes with worldly power, wealth and prestige, but the heavenly kingdom, God's kingdom. St. Paul says, God's kingdom is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But to receive God's kingdom, they must give away their money and possessions to those in need and depend on God for their security. Friends, knowing well beforehand that this demand would certainly cause some anxiety and fear in the hearts of the disciples, Jesus had begun his teaching saying, Little flock, do not be afraid. Jesus then further explains how setting their heart on worldliness could distract them from pursuing God's kingdom. He said, Where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. In other words, if the disciples' treasure is on earth, then their mind, heart and soul will be on earthly matters. However, if their treasure is in heaven, then their heart and attention will be on the heavenly things that are focused on God. Further along the way, Jesus tells a wedding analogy. In fact, Jesus has used the analogy of the wedding feast many times. He says, Gird your loins and light your lamps, and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have them recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. Friends, literally, the expression gird your loins refers to the ancient practice of pulling or tucking up one's long rope into a girdle, that is, belt, when preparing for manual labor or battle or fast action. With the addition of the lamps in the analogy, fast action is expected at night. According to the analogy, the master has gone to a wedding banquet and it is not known when he will return. It could be any time, late evening, midnight or even in the early morning hours. So it is reasonable for the servants to wait until evening and then put out the lamps and go to sleep. These servants, however, are awake, dressed in appropriate clothes, have their lamps burning and are ready to open the door the moment their master returns. Friends, no matter how late into the night it is, the servants eagerly and joyfully wait to receive and serve their master. When the master 
finally arrives and finds his servants watchful and faithful, rewards them by serving them himself the best. Friends, at the time of Jesus, it was usual for servants to sit at the table and for their masters to serve them. A similar custom is said to have existed among the Romans, Cretans and Babylonians. Friends, it is difficult to judge whether Jesus alludes to any of these. But of one thing we can be sure, through this analogy, Jesus wants his disciples to know how acceptable their zeal and faithfulness in discharging their duties will be to him, and how highly he will reward them for it. Friends, Jesus goes on to tell another analogy of a master of your house who would stay awake if he knew when a thief would come to break into his house. Friends, in this analogy, Jesus seems to stress the state of readiness for an expected coming. Then Jesus declares to his disciples, You also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. Friends, putting this all together, we learn that Jesus, the Son of Man, wants his followers not to be anxious or afraid, but to share their earthly possessions with the needy, to have a trusting faith in God's promises, and to be ready always for his second coming, but on an unexpected day and at an unknown hour. If they are good and stayed faithful until his return, they will be rewarded. But Peter then wants to know if the teaching is addressed only to the disciples or to everyone. Friends, Jesus does not answer Peter's question directly. Instead, he tells another parable about a wise and faithful manager or steward. The master, before leaving for his journey, places his most trustworthy servant over all the others. He must supervise their work and provide for their needs in the absence of his master. The manager is blessed when his master returns and discovers him faithful in his work. The master will graciously reward him with promotion. If, however, because of the master's delay, the manager mistreats those under him and misuses the master's goods to satiate his own greed, the master who comes unexpectedly and finds the servant in the midst of his mischief will punish him severely and put him among those undeserving of trust. Even more so, the manager who knows his master's plan but does not prepare himself for his master's return and does not do what is expected of him will be more severely punished. Friends, this contrasts with the servant who knew what was expected from him but failed to do it. His punishment would be less severe. Friends, Jesus concludes his teaching by saying, Much will be required of the person entrusted with much and still more demanded of the person entrusted with more. Friends, the servants in the first parable refers to Jesus' contemporaries who were called to a special life of holiness and were given laws to help them love God with all their hearts and minds and to prepare for the coming of the master of the house, that is, the Messiah, who had in fact already come among them in the person of Jesus. He kept knocking at the doors of their hearts through prophets, such as John the Baptist, but their preoccupation with ritual questions and political matters led them to ignore John's message and to reject the one pointed to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Friends, Jesus did not want his disciples to be blind, obstinate and ignorant of his return like the others. He rather wanted them as watchful servants to be ready for his return at any time and to receive their eternal rewards. And at the same time, 
He also reminded them that they were also stewards who were entrusted with the good news of God's great gift of salvation. Since they had a greater responsibility, Jesus warned them that they would be held more accountable and be judged more severely than others. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. The disciples, who were once so cowardly and afraid, became bold after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Believing in His promises, they joyfully pledged themselves to Him and literally sold all their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, and thereafter took the gospel to the ends of the earth. They spend their time doing God's work and seeking His kingdom till the end. Friends, like the apostles, we all fear a variety of things in life, such as job loss, heights, bugs, public speaking, flying, separation, loneliness, sicknesses, death, and so on. Friends, a certain amount of fear is normal and human. But oftentimes in our life, fears become, as Thomas Aquinas puts it, disordered, that is, excessive. Friends, excessive fear can affect not only our physical and mental health, but also moral life. It can cause our scope of vision too narrow, can keep us from doing what we need to do, and can drain joy out of life. Friends, in his best-known work, the Summa Theologica, Aquinas writes, Fear is such a powerful emotion for humans, that when we allow it to take over us, it drives compassion right out of our hearts. Indeed, friends, fear causes us to focus on ourselves and to disconnect from others and it hinders the spirit of generosity. As Christians, we should not hold on to material things for fear of lack of safety and certainty, but rather take courage to share them generously with our needy neighbors. And at the same time, we must respond to fear with hope and confidence in the Heavenly Father, who promises to give us the means of life and to enable us to experience a little of heaven while here on earth and in due time to behold him in his kingdom. 2. Friends, as servants of the Lord, both the church and the Christian pastors must never lose sight of our responsibilities, particularly our primary task of preaching and teaching God's word, telling people simply and clearly who God is and what He has done through His Son Jesus Christ for us and all mankind. Friends, if you fail to carry out what God has entrusted to us or squander the Christian discipleship along with all of God's other gifts, rather than putting it to good use for the salvation of others, we will be judged severely and will be eternally separated from Him. However, if we, the ministers of the church, fall into idleness or are distracted by the worldly cares and as a result fail to discern or ignore the signs of the times to feed the people and to nourish them through the means of preaching, teaching and disciplining, we will be judged more severely than those servants, though wicked, do not know and are unfaithful in their work. 3. Friends, God has given each one of us unique abilities, talents, wealth, knowledge, time, and spiritual gifts, such as encouragement or teaching, and expects us to manage them wisely and selfishly, to use them well, to glorify God and benefit others. Friends, when we use whatever gift we have received from God in this way, we will be like His good servants and faithful stewards. 4. Friends, we are God's servants waiting for the return of our Master and our Lord Jesus Christ, not knowing when He will return. Meanwhile, 
Let us do diligently, consistently and faithfully what he wants us to do on this earth. When he comes back and finds us faithful, he will surely reward us. Amen. God bless you.